much. Thank you, everyone. Um, if I could just ask everybody to stand up for a second, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning back, yes? Good morning. Well, let's wake everyone up. Let's get some more energy here. Okay, thank you so much. A little stretch. <laughs> Sit down again, and let's get going here. Um, this is, we're going to be talking about, yes, thank you. <laughs> Lead us in some exercises. We're going to be talking here about some of the most exciting places for the development of not just these countries that are going, undergoing fundamental changes and seeing things happen that had never happened before, but the actual internet itself and the future of the web and technology. Uh, we have uh, uh, in, in our panelists an incredible amount of expertise to tap here. Uh, Lek Lexi Novitska, who uh, went on a six-month sabbatical from a P firm in the US, uh, 12 years later is still in Lagos, uh, making in some incredible investments and companies in, in, in Africa, Pan-African as well. Uh, Bunmi Akinyemeju, who is a partner at Greenhouse Capital, began as a venture builder, found that it was not scaling fast enough, so actually shifted to a VC model because that was the only way to fast scale quickly enough to meet the demand and the opportunity of Nigeria and Africa more broadly. And Dirk van, uh, van, van Kwekebeke of Be Next, uh, early stage VC who is based in Singapore. He's going to talk a lot today about uh, looking at India, Southeast Asia, Japan, a lot of uh, uh, ex-US. He's going to be talking, however, today mainly about India where he introduced me to the concept of the ABCD strategy, which he began in 2009. That's where you focus on astrology, Bollywood, cricket, and discounts. <laughs> uh, he then shifted to the time warp arbitrage model, where you're bringing models from Silicon Valley into a market where they were not before, uh, but now really looking at the fundamentals of how the internet is changing India, but more importantly, how India's internet will change the world. And let's start with Dirk talking a little bit now about what is actually happening in India. Many people are not aware of India's stack, which is a fundamental change to the way an entire, one of the most, most populous nations reacts and interacts with the internet. What is India's stack? Sure. So maybe one word about my background. I moved in 2009 to Singapore and India. Um, we started the firm in 2015. We've invested in 295 companies across 12 funds and have around 120 companies in India. Um, the India stack and, and India has gone the last 10 years through a remarkable digital transformation that started with the government essentially wanting to increase financial inclusion. Um, 10 years ago, India was consistently ranked at the bottom of the stack when it came to financial inclusion. By now, it's one of the most financially savvy countries in the world when it comes to digital payment um, products and protocols. So it started with a, a project called Adhar, which is the base layer of DPI, Digital Public Infrastructure, which is essentially a citizen database that captures 10 biometric um, marks, your 10 fingerprints, your eyes, and your nose. And they managed to do that over the span of 10 years. They took it from zero to 1.2 1, 1. billion people. So, so this, is, this is an, an, an unbanked, un, sort of a, a market where there is no infrastructure, no, no information. Infrastructure. Yeah. And now everybody is, they, they, they can establish identity and therefore participate in transactions. Correct. It's financially included and, and, and can participate and enter a transaction no matter where they are in the country. So they can, it can be the, the weakest link in the country, a farmer in northern India, that can enter into a financial transaction, can send money. Um, the second part of the India stack, so Adhar is the citizen database, if you will, um, the second part of the stack that, that's really remarkable is called UPI, Unified Payment Interface, which is a, an effort by the RBI, the regulator locally, like the equivalent of BaFin in Germany, um, that brought the banks together and said, we have to take the noise out of the banking transactions. What does that mean? Again, if the farmer in the north is being penalized for having a minimum deposit that is too low and has to pay penalty on it, he's not going to use it if he's going to be penalized for doing a P2P transfer where the amount is too small, he's not going to use it. 
So UPI essentially took all that noise out, the fees, and it's free. You can do P2P transfer instant for free. You can recon your bank account. It's free. You can... Um, which, which essentially gives every single person in India a bank account, or the, the, the ability to act as instant. if they have a, 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 a instantly have a bank account. Exactly. And you were saying just a few moments ago, if you compare Visa, which has been around for 60 years... 66, yeah. 66 years of Visa. How many transactions? Yeah. So they have 25 billion transactions. 25 billion transactions globally. versus UPI, which has been around just for five years. 10 billion transactions a month. 10 billion just transactions in India. a month. And that's QR code acceptance, that's P2P transfers, that's bank deposits, whatever it is. Um, it's a remarkable transformation. And never, never seen before. Without technology, this would have taken 80 years. Okay, great. Bunmi, maybe if we can come to look at what, what is unique, different, what's happening in Nigeria. Yeah, absolutely. And to um, start off with my background a little bit, um, I've just been very entrepreneur from a very young age. Uh, born in Michigan, but Nigerian parents. And so I went to school in, in Michigan State and started three companies while in school and after. I realized that the entrepreneur energy in Michigan is just different from what I'm used to in Nigeria. So moved back to Nigeria. Different meaning not as exciting, not as moving as quickly. Yeah, not as quickly, not as, I mean, and so I think Steffi visited Nigeria and since then she's been an evangelist. Everybody needs to visit Nigeria. Why? Because of that entrepreneur energy. So that, that's what brought me back. Uh, 13 years ago. And so I spent 10 years and essentially built about 15 companies, you know, via venture uh, studio model, because I think just entrepreneurship is really the secret to unlocking uh, economic development. So that's, I truly believe that the hardest problems in the world, uh, you solve them by just backing uh, entrepreneurs. And so, um, after creating these 15 companies, I realized that I can't create enough uh, by myself. So I need to back other people. And how do you do that? Venture capital. So if we're able to democratize venture capital, we'll solve the, the, the biggest problems in Nigeria. So I created a fund, Greenhouse Capital. So we've done fund one, fund two. And I think if we start talking about what's unique about Nigeria... What, 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 is the, what is the substrate or what is the context that's allowing this to, ha to take place? Absolutely. And I think the first part is just the, the resilience, right? The resi resilience of the Nigerian people, the African people. I think that's the first piece. Everybody, every home has an entrepreneur. Everybody is creating a company, right? Everybody is hustling. And I think if you ever visit Lagos, that's just what you feel. The moment you land at the airport and everywhere you go, everybody's creating companies. Now, the enabling structure, the enabling infrastructure, the VC asset class, right, the, the policies, right, and the bridges that need to happen between countries, that is the piece that needs to be accelerated. And you can already see what's going on now. 2016, um, I think there is maybe about $400 million of, of venture capital. You know, fast forward six years later, you know, 2022, there is, you know, $5 billion coming um, um, into the continent, right? With Nigeria taking about 20 to 25% of, of that, right? And it tells you the opportunity. So for me, I think investing in emerging economies, a lot of times you just got to take a trip, right? Don't believe what you, le what you read in the newspapers. Don't believe about, you know, you, you hear a lot of the risks, the issues, the challenges, but somehow you have to almost tell yourself that, who is planting that message? Maybe they're trying to prevent me from coming. <laughs> There's too much opportunity, they're trying to keep me out. Absolutely, <laughs> okay, absolutely. Great. Lexi, if you could tell you a little bit about, you know, we, we, we've heard Nigeria opportunity there, yeah. Pan-Africa, looking at the way that we can bring, you know, the Silicon Valleys of Africa, or what is, what is the way exactly. that you can scale out uh, uh, these opportunities of the, of the continent uh, uh, from market to market? Yeah, so you, you mentioned a little bit of my backstory. Um, I saw this incredible opportunity that I thought the rest of the world wasn't paying attention to and decided to leave my hedge fund job and, and move to Africa. 
and set up a, a VC firm, um, very early days of the ecosystem, and that through different iterations has now grown to our $200 million fund, which we have today. But what we, what I really saw is, is this incredible superpower of Africa was certainly the demographics. Um, average age of 19, we're in China, you know, that's nearly 40. And that is going to be even more drastic by the end of the century with 40% of the world's population being African. And this population is young, they're essentially born with a mobile phone in their hand. They don't have access to a lot of the services that all of us have. They don't have healthcare, education, financial services. And for the first time, they're able to access this through their mobile phone. Um, and that is really incredible to see. And, and you know, we kind of talk about this latecomer advantage, looking at markets like... Le leapfrogging over the issues that were previously exactly. there. For the yeah, previous. exactly. So looking to markets like Southeast Asia and India and all the business models that have been big success stories there. There, and taking a lot of those learnings into the African continent and saying, look, the innovation maybe isn't necessarily on the business model, it's on the execution and it's, it's making these business models hyper-local to unlock some of these challenges that are being faced. I mean, there is not a shortage of problem set across the African continents. Okay. Um, and yeah, and you mentioned the Silicon Valley. Yeah, so of if Africa, you could quickly, could, quickly say something, what, yeah. what are the Silicon Valleys and what are, what are their sort of specialties? Yeah, so another one of those demographic shifts is certainly rapid urbanization. But what you've really seen is these, uh, just a handful of core markets um, be becoming these really strong tech hubs. So that's Lagos, Nairobi, it's Cape Town, it's Cairo. And their themes, Lagos would be. Yeah, for Lagos, I mean, it's just unlocking the Nigerian opportunity that Bumi mentioned, but especially in fintech. Fintech, okay. Um, Nairobi. Nairobi, I would say, is a, a lot of impact-oriented industries, um, but especially catered to that East Africa side and looking for some Pan-African expansion as Cape well. Cape Town. Cape Town, it's using the lower cost workforce in the South African market, but building business models that can be exported to developed markets across the world. So US and Europe, but leveraging that lower cost, high quality talent. Excellent, okay, and you spoke about how there's so many of these companies that have, are, are exploiting these unique, or uh, taking advantage of these unique opportunities and unique elements of these markets. And I'd love to go do a quick round robin. We have very little time left. Each of you name, uh, maybe starting this, Dirk, Dirk go back, back through it. Uh, uh, two or three companies that are very interesting because they are unique to the context uh, that we have in the markets that you're looking at. So India, what would be a, a couple of unique companies that are taking advantage of that Yeah, context? sure. Um, so as we, as we described earlier, the, the digital infrastructure allows you to do very cheap microtransactions. Um, and we invested in this company called Srimandir, which is essentially a devotional app. So India has many million gods. Why is that? Because Hinduism is a poly, poly god religion and allows for many, many sub-gods. It's a very religious continent. Um, it's not one India, really. There are many nuances to it. Um, and, and it's very hard to, if you're devotional, to visit all the pilgrimage places that you would like to see. So this app bridges the gap. It's an equivalent of this called Church of God in the U.S., which is a very successful but very unknown company to many. And this is, I would say, the Indian equivalent. So monetization could be anything like, you know, sending a micro amount to a but temple. It's small amounts to temples. Pujas, doing religious um, samples online. And it's a very Indian phenomenon, but it's huge. Um, another example, which is more sort of... There's an Uber-like example you... Uber is more local. I think I want to talk a little bit about this true zero to one innovation out of India that's going global. Um, so we invested in some very deep AI company and claims management that's now being used by top, top Fortune 10 companies in the US, um, like Kaiser Permanente or Molina, huge healthcare carriers, where no company in the world has managed to save sort of the efficiency and the fraud, it's called payment integrity, i.e fraud and wrong claims in the US context. And this company has automated a lot of that end to end and just doesn't exist. Why, why, did, it, why did the company, um, why did, how did it get born? This industry was outsourced to India. Right. And one of these experts met a coder and they launched a product that they re-exported as a product back to the US. Right. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. 
very quickly, sorry, Bunmi, yeah. next up, what, what, what are some unique investments, unique companies? Yeah, I mean, I think the context really here is, um, if you think about one of the most successful industries in Nigeria, I would say it's the financial services industry. The banks are very strong. Because they're very strong, there's a lot of Nigerian banks that are pan-African. Now, that gave birth to a very, very strong fintech you know, community. And so you see the largest fintech in Africa, which was one of our early invest investments, is Flutterwave. That's now valued over $3 billion. There's uh, Paystack that has one of the largest exits you know, on the continent to Stripe. Um, so I think just that fintech is, is a very strong area. I think mobility is also really, really big, especially if you think about it in the context of mobility plus financing, right? right? So you're talking mobility, which you can back into climate, so the EV, so I'm very excited about that space. There's a company called Max that we're invested in. Um, I think they'll become a, a, a unicorn very soon. There's a company called EFCD that we are also invested in, doing um, essentially mobility, um, sorry, two-wheelers, three-wheelers on EV. If you think about the cost of fuel, the ability to cut down the cost of fuel by 80%. So you're right? helping them, helping the two-wheeler or three-wheelers to finance the purchase of the, of, of the vehicle. Plus move to EV. Plus move to EV. So there's yes. actually a climate element to this. It's exactly. actually helping the environment as well as the entrepreneurs. Yes, absolutely. So I'm very excited about Max, very excited about EFTD, and then Flutterwave and Paystack are success right. stories that we Excellent. have so far. Lexi, what are yeah, some examples? So I know you're trying to keep us on time, so I'll, I'll take an easy example that I think really right. represents kind of this pan-African regionalization story. Um, so Africa is made up of over 50 countries, and across all these countries, fintechs are trying to expand, Visa's trying to acquire customers, global companies like Uber are coming in, trying to verify the drivers that are driving their vehicles. But there really is no unified source of identity, like has in India, for example. Right. So Smile ID, uh, one of our portfolio companies, has done the hard work of being able to document and verify every single identity document within the African continent, as well as those from international markets where and a lot of trade Incredible happens. achievement given each market has its own peculiarities. Exactly. And, and Integrated with 17 government databases. So essentially, if you are a company looking to expand to Africa, you can integrate one API and verify any of the customers you're onboarding through that API. Pretty incredible success Fantastic. story. Great. Uh, any final thoughts or comments on the opportunity that people might not see? When we're sitting here in Europe, it can be hard to see yeah. the sense of what it is. What, what, what is your pitch to so why people should get on a plane? Is, please, anybody who's interested in our market, each of us here is an ambassador. And we want to build more bridges to Germany, to Europe. Come see us after the panel, and I mean it. Like, whether it's education, pitches like these. We were talking beforehand, the interesting thing about education is the, of the major tech firms in the US, almost half of them uh, are Indian are origin, in, Indian yeah, origin yeah, yeah. leaders, which has given this incredible dynamic between India uh, and Silicon Valley. It's a very unique differentiator to any global ecosystem, really, China included, that you don't have the NRIs. NRIs are non-resident Indians, of which there are 50 million globally. A lot of them are in very prestigious R&D centers and universities and tech firms and financial services. And they went to schools that have very strong alma maters and there's a willingness to pay it forward and connect them. So we see themes out of Connected. India originating right. Right. and they go to market in the US as if, as if it's their home. Lexi, what would be the one market or one so my one takeaway is there is a massive commercial return here. Our first fund returned 10x, and we're just at the starting of this journey. Um, but there's also a massive opportunity to make life better for the 1.4 billion people calling Africa home. So it's an incredible investment destination, no matter what your motives are. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. A round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.